All right, so just let you know how the night's gonna run generally. And then we're gonna do the course description in a typical race time. So we're gonna show you a couple of pictures. For those of you who haven't been over the course, haven't done the race, we're gonna just briefly describe how it goes. So you've got a bit of context. Then Steve and Richard, that's us, we're gonna tell you some stories of, um, of our experience in the race, things that kind of went wrong um, <laughs> in a kind of a funny way. And Richard's gonna build some science and some, um, he's got a PE degree and a science degree. So he's pretty knowledgeable on this sort of stuff. So he's gonna build some of that uh, training coaching type information into his stories as well. But we wanna let you know that we've got a Q&A session, which is the major part of tonight. So we wanna get your questions. And uh, we've, this is our seventh uh, roadshow um, info night uh, at a Kathmandu store. And so we've got a pretty go good idea of the sort of questions you guys are likely to wanna ask. So we've built into our stories some of those answers that we think you'll ask. Uh, questions that you think you'll ask, and then for anything left over, we've allowed a large part of the evening for you guys. Is that all right? Cool. Righto, so how many kilometres is it? 243, yep, that's right. And uh, so we start on Kamara Beach, Serpentine Beach, and uh, this is the two day start. It's in the daylight. So if you're doing the one day race, it's an hour earlier at, at 6 a.m. So this is 7 a.m. for the two day start. So if you're doing the one-day race, you, um, it's a wee bit harder to see here. That's the only real difference. We run 2.4 kilometres up to the start of the biking. So it's short now. It used to be three. Oh, it actually used to be a bit longer than that as well. But they've brought the transition area back to be like a, uh, like a triathlon transition area. So you enter a gravel car park, run around a loop, pick up your bike and run out again. So everyone has to run the same distance. So those who remember that the bikes all used to be lined up along the side of the road, it's now changed. And so the run, this, this short 2.4k run, is up a, um, a gravel road to start with. Once you've got over these rocks, a gravel road, and then a tar sealed road. I just wanted to show you this picture that there's actually some rocks to scramble over first. Then uh, it's a 55k bike. It's about two hours. Because there's masses of you starting at the same time and only separated by that 2.4k run, you end up being uh, in quite a large bunch probably. So you'll need to get used to riding in close proximity to other riders. Like I remember my one day race, that typically the bunch size is between 50 and 100, so it's quite large and it's a bit unruly. Um, some of you will be splintering off into smaller bunches and so normal bunch riding sort of stuff applies. So that's about two hours and then we head into the main divide, into the uh, wilderness away from the road. And this is where the real adventure part starts and it's stunning, up the, um, up the Deception River. And uh, it's, it's a very specific skill, rock running. You, know, you can be the fittest runner. You know, you might be a, a fantastic marathon or 10K runner, but you can't, or you're not likely to finish unless you've done some skills training, rock running, and getting the, that proprioception and that balance and the foot-eye coordination going. So that's a specific skill you need to train for. It's, it's actually glorious in there. I mean, people have seen goats and you know, animals up there, and it is called Goat Pass after all, <laughs> and deer. Um, and it's, it's beautiful, mostly rock running, a little bit of boardwalk over Goat Pass and down the other side um, into Klondike Corner. So if you're doing the two-day race, you'll, uh, that's where you stop. And most competitors camp the night there. You can bring a camper van, a tent, whatever. There's a, a big camping area supplied with port uh, The Sheffield School has food supplied if you want to buy some food, if you haven't brought your own. And it's a really cool sense of camaraderie. It's heart, in the heart of Arthur's Pass, the main divide, Southern Alps. It's beautiful scenery. Some people decide to go back to Greymouth, Hokitika, maybe Arthur's Pass for, for a motel type of thing, or even to, over to Sheffield or Christchurch even. But I'd encourage you, if you're a first-timer, you, you really want to soak up the atmosphere by, by camping. And uh, so after that, the next morning, if you're doing the two-day race, we start with a, a, a cycle, 15 kilometres. This is reasonably hilly. Um, and if you're in the, doing the one-day race, of course, you finish the, the run and you keep on trucking on with a ride, it's a little 15k, half an hour ride, 40 minute ride, and, and then you start the um, kayak down the Waimaka Riri, which is for the fastest people around four hours, and it's class two white water, so on the scale of classes, it's uh, zero is flat, flat water, and six, you, you die. So <laughs> class, class, class two is just moderate, but you do need to get a, a grade two certificate from a certified instructor, and we, um, I'd highly recommend uh, going on a, on a good course and getting really proficient at whitewater paddling uh, little short boats before you uh, tackle the long boats. And just get really happy on the river so you're not scared of the rapids and, and you just feel totally confident. You put 100% of your effort into going forward. So that's a skill you need to learn is, is whitewater skill. 
And then uh, we finished with a 70k, sorry, 68k bike across the Canterbury Plains to New Brighton Beach now. And so this is another a whole new part of the challenge to me. You've had the excitement, the adventure of the mountain stage, the Southern Alps, and then you've got you're faced with a an Ironman type challenge. You know, long, boring, straight road, and you have to have mental fortitude for this. And there's another. This is the complete athlete, if you like, is being able to do all those disciplines. And it's into a headwind. It's a sea breeze at that time of year. 31 years out of the 34 races, there's been a significant headwind. The other years has been a southerly or something like that, which is a sidewind. So you can pretty much bet on it being a headwind for you, and it gets stronger the closer you get to the finish line because it's a sea breeze. So are you getting the idea? But therein lies the satisfaction, folks. Isn't that, doesn't that sound good? You know, you've, you've got to really be on to your game. You've got to... Attention... No, energy flows where attention goes. So if you're focusing on the, the negative stuff and the pain and the suffering, that's, you, you're not, not going to perform. So you want to focus on, hey, this is a, a challenge. It's going to be really worthwhile. If it was easy, everyone would do it, wouldn't they? So, but you know, I'll tell you what really makes it worthwhile is the waiting crowd. It's just fantastic. The, these people have been listening to the radio. The public have come down just to see you finish. And, of course, there's family and friends who have come down to personally con congratulate you. So... You know, I'm getting goosebumps as I'm talking to you about this. It's just super satisfying. And as you're standing on the finish line under the arch, you finish, you've got your, your chips in your chair in your, in your hand, and you turn around and you face the direction you've just come. And you, you think back to the journey over the last 6 to 12 months, the training, all the, the scary skills, learning, all that stuff. And then there's the race itself, the pain and the suffering and the joy. And you have this huge sense of satisfaction that I did it my way, you know. I faced the... The dangers, the risks, I learned the skills and I managed it and I finished it. So I'd, those of you on the fence about you know, thinking whether you're going to enter or not, that alone is worth it. You know, the goosebumps you get and the stories you can tell over dinner um, in, in the following years. I'm pleased to say it used to be space, sponsored by Spates, but now we've got the perfect sponsor. Kathmandu is a perfect fit. And it's all that, you know, it's so much more appropriate. So thanks Kathmandu for coming on board and providing a, a really good, um, good match. Okay, what I want to do next is all what, like we know the um, the like hey the course is, is great. We what I want to do is give you guys a bit of an idea of what the how long the race actually takes and what's involved. We've got often we see this image. It's the guy at the top of the podium and he's spraying bubblies around and he's done super amazing times. And I oh yeah three yeah so I'm going to try and do it in three and a half. I'll give myself a little bit of a, a leeway there. But this race is actually really 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 achievable as long as you break it down properly and set yourself up and have a good race plan and on, on it goes. So we're really actually super lucky because we've got this person sitting right down the front right here and this is Millie Smith, come on Woo! up there. I was super fortunate enough to actually work with Millie for this year's race. She came to me about this time last year-ish and said, I've got a bucket list and this race is one of the things right up the top of that bucket list. So, Smelly, do you want to maybe give us a bit of a background of your story and why that was the case? Um, so, get the elephant out of the room. Um, I've got terminal kidney cancer. Um, so, my bucket list was the coast to coast. Um, as a child, I'd always gone down to the finish line and watched them come in. And two years ago now, it was 2016 race, I went down, did the same thing, turned to my husband and said, and I've always wanted to do that one day. My one day's run out, it had to be now. Um, so, started off with just running, as you do, you know, train for that half marathon, run on the streets. The run is nothing like that, <laughs> <laughs> by the way, at all. Um, for me, it was just about finishing it. When you tell people that, oh, I've done the coast to coast, no one ever asks, where did you come? Or how did you do it? It's just you finished it, wow, you're amazing, that's an awesome achievement. Um, I wanted to get through without being injured and enjoy it all. I wanted to see the scenery, I wanted to enjoy that bike ride, um, the kayak. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so for me it wasn't about times, it was just about making that, the cut off, there are cut off times that you do need to do, but they are very achievable. Um, if you walk, run, the the run, mountain run leg of it, you will definitely make the time. So, yeah, it's, it's easy. 
Yep. So, yeah. train. You do have to train for it, of course. You can't say that you're just going to be able to get up on the, the track and do it. Cool. So maybe, Millie, you can help me talk, uh, we'll talk through these together. So, yep. so you got the first stage. Yes. Sam did it that in seven minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you go through that. Yeah, four times. Cool. So yeah. Yep. Okay. The next bike ride, an hour and a half, which is yes. crazy quick, by yep. the way. How was your bike ride? Uh, so bike ride, I got into a good bunch at the back. Um, I really, you do need to learn bunch riding if you're not familiar with it. Um, it will save you so much time and so much energy. Um, so you take turns at the front and so forth. Um, to clarify, I did do this whole thing with my husband as well, um, so, and he was a bit broken. We'll get to that down yeah. there, sure. <laughs> we will. Uh, so, yeah, the so. Ma the mountain run took Sam three hours, which is a crazy quick time considering yeah. what the course is involved. Yeah. Now, your husband, has he retired from multi-sport now? Yes, <laughs> well and truly retired. <laughs> so this mountain run, from what I understand, you could have actually done that quicker than that. But yeah, you so were waiting for... I was aiming for about six and a half to seven hours mountain run, um, but he had torn his hamstring, so we pretty much power walked the whole thing. So, um, 28 river crossings we counted. So do practice the river crossings and the boulder jumping and boulder rocks. There's very little just running on a track. So. Um, and that's, this is the start of the next day, 27 yes. minutes, this is 41. Yep. Cool. Up in the morning yep. and away. Pretty normal. So quick run down to the, um, to the boats. Yes. And then we've got a kayak yes. with four hours. And this is quite an impressive time, really. Mm -hmm. So five and a half hours for that. Um, yes. <laughs> again, Millie, one of our other bucket list things was going to Europe, wasn't it? It was, yeah. So I I strongly recommend getting down that river as much as you can. Do your guided trips down, get your grade two as soon as you can. I broke my finger severely, it meant I couldn't do my grade two course when I wanted to, so that put me through to October. I think I ended up getting it done. My husband and I then went to Europe for six weeks in December. I got down the river once, and two weeks before going to the coast to coast, I panicked and couldn't. I, I didn't have the confidence to do it. So we had a solution. We did. We had a tandem boat, yes. which is great. Yes. And then we put a New Zealand representative yes. kayaker in the we front did. of that boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the world is away. Yeah. Um, to put that into perspective, though, my husband did do it in a sea kayak, and I think he did it in about seven hours. Down, just so under seven hours. Millie's final bike ride looks a bit slow, but that's because she was sitting waiting for her husband <laughs> to arrive. Yeah. 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 So, and the bike ride as well, um, again, howling easterly. Um, the Norwester had changed. <laughs> it's it's the bike. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, get into a good bunch if you're doing the two day. I don't think you can draft, can you, in the one day? So, but get into a good bunch and take turns. So. Well, yeah. well done, Millie. Right, so we're going to tell you some stories, things that went wrong, the mistakes we made, so you don't have to make those same mistakes. So I'm going to tell you about my very first coast to coast. Yes, it was a long time ago. I just, um, I was still living in a student flat. I'd just graduated. I finished my degree, and um, I laid out on the kitchen table all the things that I think I wanted to eat in the race. And I'd done quite a bit of hiking and biking and kayaking trips and adventures and things. So I had an idea of what sort of food I liked on those long sort of endurance sessions. And uh, so I had laid out my mum's fruit cake. I love quiche. You know, it's quite moist and got lots of protein and it's easy to eat. So I had a big quiche, juicy quiche. And I thought, I can't eat the quiche on the run. So I had pizza. You know, it's quite dry and it travels well, so I had pizza. I liked orange segments peeled in little Ziploc bags. I liked banana, so I had banana, bananas peeled. And egg sandwiches with curry and a little bit of parsley on it, white bread. Mm -mm. And fish. I loved you know, tuna and, and salmon and stuff, so I had a few cans of fish. And I thought, right, drink, what am I going to drink? So I thought, oh, well, I quite enjoy milk, so I thought, I have some milk. <laughs> and and orange juice, I thought orange juice. Right, so I had all this laid on the table, and I thought, man, how am I going to package all that up 
and fit it into little, you know, convenient things that I can put in my pockets and on the run and the kayak and how am I going to get all that? But man, this is going to be a bit tricky. So I thought, the obvious solution, put it in a blender. So I put the whole lot in the blender. <laughs> it's going to end up that way anyway, isn't it? You chew it and swallow it, it's all going to be mixed up. So I thought, save the chewing process. And um, it'll be quick to get down when I'm trying to paddle. Because there's a little saying that says every time a, a sheep bars, it loses a bite. So I figured every time, if I'm kayaking, every time I took my hand off the paddle to get some food out and feed myself, that's a paddle stroke or three or four, ten lost. So I thought, swallow it all much quicker just by drinking it. Do you want to know how it tasted? <laughs> Fermented. Bubbly. Non-digestible. So my race was a bit of a nightmare. And fortunately, my support crew managed to find bananas and things during the race to swap that stuff out with. So I made a number of mistakes, obviously. Never use anything new on race day. Always test it in training. Uh, that's the main one. So I thought, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, the sheep bar thing is a quite a good one too, isn't it? You want to drink on the kayak. Um, so what, we, what did we do next? So I thought, well... There's an, a huge array of gels and, and commercial things available nowadays, perhaps not so in those days. And so I've been racing, using those sorts of things, you know, like um, lemon squeezes are the one I really enjoy. That seems to work for me, and they have eight different flavours, so you can mix them all up and you're not getting bored with the same flavour. And I, so I have a squeezy, I've calculated off the back of the packet um, how many calories um, I need per hour. So every 27 minutes I can have a squeezy. So I set your alarm on your watch as you're running, beep, beep, off, off it goes and you're down a squeezy and then follow it with some water. And so I like that because it's not a pre-concentrated drink, drink, you know, like how you mix it up at the, the recommended concentration. But as the day warms up, you need to have more water intake or as it cools off, you need to have less water intake and you've got its fixed concentration. So personally, I prefer to have the calorific intake separate from the water intake. So as the day gets hotter, I can have more litres. So in a hot February day like that, at the peak of the day, you can sweat around about a litre an hour. So that's, you know, a litre an hour you need to drink. So um, you have to think about that sort of fluid intake. And if your drink's pre-mixed, it may not be the right concentration for you. And then you end up with cramps and things. So that's my learning from that. But I've also found that on the one day race, the longest day, about halfway through the day, I'm starting to crave some real food. And so I have on that middle cycle leg, I have pre-prepared, um, yeah, I do like egg sandwiches. So I have an egg sandwich and I have a piece of my mum's fruit cake and I have a piece of quiche. <laughs> and I eat those, they're easy to eat in the pocket as you're riding along that middle cycle leg, that 15 Ks. You can easily reach back and still be speeding along as I'm eating. So uh, not so on the run though, it's not easy to do on the run. So I like the squeezies on the run and then scoop some river water. So, um, and once again, I, 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 a bit of advice, my opinion on the mountain run. <laughs> I, I don't believe that you need uh, to carry any water over there. I see people still with, carrying a camel back with three, three or four litres of water in it, and I think, oh, well, what's the point? You know, a drinking bladder. When you've got this pu beautiful, pure mountain water you can drink out of the Deception or the River, uh, Deception or the Minga. The only two I wouldn't drink out of is the first one, the Oterra, because it's flowing out of the Oterra Township. We're not sure if it's pure or not. And same with the last river over near Klondike Corner. I wouldn't drink that one either because it's come out of Arthur's Pass. But apart from that, you're never more than five minutes from a creek as you're running up, up the Deception and down the Ninga. And so um, various methods we can use for that. Well, I used to just use a double scoop of hand, uh, a double hand scoop as I cross the river. Every river crossing, I'd make sure I have a, um, a double scoop. But um, more, for, more recently, I um, had a Tetra pack, you know, like the up and goes. Um, and I had it on a wee piece of elastic, and it was just clipped to my waist belt on my pack, and so I wouldn't drop it, scoop it as I'm running across the Rorton River. But even better now, I've seen athletes who use a Ziploc bag, even lighter. So you just scoop it as you're crossing, and you know, you can squeeze the neck of it shut, and it look like, looks like you've got a goldfish. <laughs> um, um, and they're just drinking this as they're running, by you know, holding it up to their mouth and squeezing it in. So that's a, probably my choice of system. Others use a cup on a on a bungee, and I, um, I think Chris is going to tell us a, a little innovation that they've got coming out of Kathmandu, which looks exciting too. So there's various methods for drinking, but you don't need to carry a bladder through there. The only reason I think people need to carry a bladder if they insist on having a pre-mixed drink. Um, what else did I learn? Oh yeah, my last story on the nutrition thing here. So, you know, I had this disaster the first year of fermented mixed up <laughs> drink, and I thought, right, I'm going to use the proper stuff. So in the next race I had, which had a four-hour mountain run, 
it was the Southern Crossing across the Dunstan Trail, and I tried for four hours to eat three chocolate power bars, and I hated them. I didn't, you know, I just hated the taste and hated trying to chew them whilst running. And I learned that, you know, I only ever, only ended up eating half a power bar, which meant, of course, I bonked, you know, hadn't eaten enough. And so I learned, well, you can have the ideally scientific food, but if you don't feel like eating, you're not going to eat it and you're going to blow up. So um, if a packet of greasy chips is what's going to get you to eat, I'd say eat it. So um, I think eating real food is, is a really good thing if that's what it takes for you to eat enough or get enough calories in for the race. Okay, one, two, for you guys, just a picture, or actually, what are the goals for standing on the start line? I want you to close your eyes for a moment for me, please. Close your eyes. You're standing on Kamara Beach. It is quarter to six. The sun's just come up. You've just gone down to touch the water. It's kind of cold. You can hear the waves behind you splashing. There's, there's nervous energy around. There's other competitors and things milling around, a bit of nervous chatter and things going on. What do you, what should you be thinking about while you're standing on the start line? Right, you can open your eyes. Okay, it can be really, really nerve-wracking standing there. Have I done everything I need to do? I like to say there's four things as you're standing on the start line that you can kind of tick the box. The first one is being as fit as you possibly can. It's a bit of a given because we know that this race is long and hard and I have to be fit to be able to actually get across the finish line and achieve that. So, so hey, we start doing some training. The next one, which is just as important, if not more important, is actually being fresh. When we're doing endurance sport, we think more is better, more is better, more is better. But you get to a point that basically that just makes you tired. And especially in those last couple of weeks leading up to the race, you've actually got to, it's harder to do nothing than it is to do more. You think, ah, I'll just do that one last one because I missed that one the other week and that'll make me better for race day. But what it does, it just makes you tighter and therefore you're worse. You want to be like a coiled spring. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a lion in a cage, just let me go. I just want to run. I just feel like I need to do something today. And that's what you feel the day before, but just bottle that up. And, uh, and save it for the next day. The next one is injury free. This race is relatively technical. You want to practice rock running and all those sorts of things. So naturally, it's pretty easy to go over on the old ankle. Hey, if I haven't um, done a huge amount of running and um, I want to get into that and build that up, there's a chance of, hey, doing the old hammy, calf muscles, etc. I'd say that's probably 75% of the people that are standing with you on that start line have had some form of injury that they've had to deal with. Probably 25% have still got those injuries and wondering if that dicky knee is actually going to survive. So if you can be there injury free, that's going to basically set your day up. Okay? So we've got fit as you can, fresh and ready to go, and injury free. And I think the last one, and probably most important one for that nerves in the stomach and, and how you're feeling, is making sure you've got a good plan. And that's something that we work with Millie on. So, okay, Millie, we're going to run from this point to this point. It's going to take about this long, and this is how you're going to do it. Okay, and then the bike ride. This is how you're going to do that. This is a bit of an idea of time. This is what we're going to do in terms of nutrition. And, and on it goes. Then we've got, okay, what could possibly go wrong? We could get a flat tyre. We could, we could um, get caught up in a bunch crash. Okay, well, how do I decrease the chances of that happening? Okay, well, let's ride maybe in a smaller bunch if you're not happy with that, or, or ride at the front and post it towards the back. That sort of stuff. So basically, with that plan, what you can say is that, okay, well, I've, I've practiced this plan and I've, I've trained myself well. Basically, you want to be there saying, okay, it's time for me to challenge myself. Let's execute this plan as best as I possibly can. And let's enjoy the ride and just see what happens. And, and, and as a result of that, you don't have to be so nervous. And then, and then you can just go out there and have an awesome time. Cool. So fit as you can, fresh and ready to go, injury free. And with the plan, you'll be all over it. Right, so first race, again, kayaking leg. I was hanging on and hanging on, but I was busting. I needed a pee. And I, um, I hadn't anticipated this. You know, I guess if you're drinking and eating enough, there's a good chance you're going to need a pee. <laughs> so I was hanging on. It was two hours into the run, I was into the kayak. I was getting down to the gorge. Then the gorge is starting to get those big wrappers, and I thought, man, I'm just hanging on so much. My energy, because I'm focusing on going to the toilet, is going to the wrong place, you know? Energy flows where attention goes, so I needed to deal with this. So I thought, all right, here we go. So I tried to pee, and I couldn't. And I learned that, you, well, I did in the end, you had to lean right back and lift your bum off the seat to be able to pee. So I know this conversation is going to sort of the gutter, but this is the reality, ladies and gentlemen, folks. 
Yeah, look, we got lots of nods at the back. Look at this. People who pee their boat, pee their kayak, um, peeing the bike. That's another one. Oh, anyway, I just finished the kayak story. <laughs> and then suddenly things were so much easier. I peed. And I could focus on my, uh, my getting down the river and, and, and then actually enjoying it, apart from the sloshing, you know, bit in the boat. Nowadays, of course, you can put in pumps. You know, there's a foot-operated pump that sits on or mounts on your footrest and you just pump the water out, out the outlet. Just don't put the outlet in front of you, okay, because the headwind it just ends up, you know, getting your own back if you put it out the side. But um, anyway, I didn't tell my dad. He was my support crew. didn't tell my dad that I'd peed in my boat. And so his support crew, when he's on his own, he just tips it out and gets it all over, the water all over him. It, he didn't know it was urine because it was kind of a bit diluted, a bit of water leaked in through my spray skirt. And if you're drinking enough, it's quite dilute anyway. Anyway, I took off to the finish line and uh, Dad was there waiting. He'd driven ahead and he was waiting in the hot sun. And I gave him a big hug and said, G'day, Dad, thanks for what... Oh, man, have you peed yourself? <laughs> and, and it was a wee while before we figured out that it was actually my pee that... And, you know. So... <laughs> First thing is, yes, you will probably need a pee in the, in the race and get used to it. And, you know, you can put the pump in the boat. That's good, a good thing. And it's good if you get a, get a bit of a leak as well through your spray skirt and stuff. Um, so you need to practice it in training. Same with the bike. Why would we not want to get off the bike to go for a pee? One, it takes time, but there's another reason. I mean, the bunch, yeah, the bunch is a huge advantage. 20%, 30% faster. And if you stop, you're going to lose that bunch of advantage. So it's pretty common. I'll let you know. Cyclists pee a lot. You know, if they're in a long race, it's pretty normal. Um, bit of etiquette, though. You might want to go to the back of the bunch to have a pee. <laughs> so, so once again, you need to practice that. You know, getting up off of the saddle, it's usually when you need to do it while you're coasting on a bit of a downhill. Um, and you, it's a practice thing. You have to let go of the right muscles and get the pressure off your urethra and that sort of stuff. Um, so that's about all there is on that one. Okay. Um, I talked about standing on the start line injury free. It's all well said and done, but, but how do we actually do that? And I like to break things down into, into these five phases. You've got a very small head, Steve, by the way. Right, that's better. Okay, so foundation phase, general preparation phase, getting more specific with the event, getting ready to roll, ready to race, and actually making sure you have a bit of an off-season, some time off especially if this is something you want to go back and do again. I reckon really this is the most important phase, and it's awesome that you guys have come along tonight, you're thinking about next year, because you've got time to do this. You don't have to just jump straight into, holy heck, I've got to get ready for this race. You can get yourself sorted first. So I'd say there's probably three things that the foundation phase is about. Number one is, is, is um, basically saying how fit, uh, sorry, how flexible and how strong you are. Are you tight in certain areas? Are you weak in certain areas? A good physio will be able to help you with this. So basically they see bodies every day and they'll go, they'll, they'll do some different tests on you and they'll, they'll say you've got really weak hamstrings or you're really tight here. If you drive a desk for a job and you're down like this, you probably have really tight hip flexors and you have no butt muscles. So when you start to do some running, that's going to affect other areas. So understanding that, and then as a result of that you can say, okay, Here's three key stretches that you need to do, and there's here three key strength exercises you need to do. You can do those every day, just little bits. You can do them during your run or whatever you're doing as well. So then it's just little bits, little bits, and then your body will adapt and be stronger and less likely to be injured. In terms of the foundation phase, the other key part of that is technique. So thinking about how do I move? How do I run? We think running is, is, is easy. We just get out the door and run. We've always done it. But especially if you've... If you've if you say study lots or again sit down for a job, you probably don't move like you used to when you were a kid. So actually learning what are some key things around that? How do I run? How do I kayak? So I'm not going to get um, wrist injuries, that sort of stuff. So thinking about how do I move and then thinking about am I strong and flexible? And I think the other key thing, especially for, for mums that are going to do it with uh, work and family and that sort of thing, is also just developing a bit of a routine is really important if you can, if you're not a shift worker. Um, because hey, I do this on a Tuesday, and then I do this on a Thursday, and I do this on a Sunday. And then as a result of that, you can sort of build that routine. Everybody knows what you're going to do. And then come closer to the race, hey, it's these Tuesday, Thursday ones can stay the same, but I'm just going to do a little bit more on this Sunday one. And the family knows, everybody knows, you know, you know how you respond and recover from that. So 
I think that's super important. After this, this is basically, let's add a little bit extra time, get out there a little bit more. Going tramping with a pack on your back for a day or two is an awesome way to do that. Go sea kayaking, etc. There's great places around um, Littleton Harbour and Akira to go and do that sort of stuff. This one is going, okay, well let's get a bit more specific with the event. Let's go and do a bike ride, then get used to getting off your bike and going for a little run around the block for five minutes. I would say this one I generally want to start for the coast to coast, depending on your level, ability and your experience and what you want to get out of it, maybe around maybe October-ish could be quite a good time to start, maybe November depending on what you're up to. And then this one is, hey, get ready to race. You might actually do a practice race or two on this one as well, just to test what you're up to. And, and, and in Canterbury here we're really lucky because there's like a salmon run that's just down the road, there's lots of good little races that are happening around the place, um, ones up in the hills and things. And then this one is, okay, let's get used to actually putting your toe on the start line, what do the butterflies feel like, and let's go fast and see what happens. Even that, just finishing the race is what it's about. Just do some shorter stuff. And hey, this is a bit of a speed phase. It must, might last four weeks-ish, something like that. And this one, hey, if you want to do it again, often what I tend to find is after the race, people are fired up and they just want to do more. And that was awesome, wasn't it? Let's go and do more. So yeah, cool, go and do that. But what will tend to happen is your body will be able to keep going, but it'll be this thing, you're just like, oh, I've had enough. I don't want to do this anymore. So it's... It's really good to try and plan that in and actually catch that before it happens and before you've overdone it. So things like doing some study or if you've got a family holiday planned or you've got another project that work that you need to get into. Some of that other stuff to sort of get stuck into is really good to plan around here. So breaking that down, having a bit of a roadmap of how we're going to do it will really help you step by step and then be able to achieve that. Right, let's go and have an awesome time. Come race day. Well, no, story number three. Kayaking. It was about the fifth year I was doing the race. My dad was my, my support crew again. And my kayak that year, well, let me tell you, we're just heading down to the start line. We dropped the bike off, and dad was about to depart for the run transition. And I remember at the last minute, oh, dad, dad, dad. So in the, in the hurry, in the rush, I told him, look, my kayak on the bow, there's that end loop, you know, the thing you tie down to the bumper if it's a windy day, the bit of tape or the cord on the end. And I said, uh, it's, it's weaving on the end, and I said to Dad, look, that one's quite a long one, you know, it drags in the water, uh, could you just tape it up um, for when I get in the boat? So he had to drive ahead and go to the transitions and all that, and when he, so I was asking him, when he put the boat in the water and got a scrutiny needle and that, could he just du duct tape the top back? And um, so that's right, I started the race, off I went, several hours later, got to the kayak leg, jumped in the kayak, see you Dad, paddling down the river, and something was dragging in the, in the water on the bow. And I thought, oh, damn, there's a bit of stick or a leaf or something in the, on the bow. And so I was bouncing the boat up and down, trying to get it, dislodge it, and it wouldn't come off. And I thought, look, I don't want to stop, because I was in the lead. I had about a 20-minute lead, and um, hot on my tail, well, not hot on my tail, but 20 minutes behind was John Jacoby, Australian. He's the world marathon paddling, paddle champion, and I had to have a buffer. Um, I built up on the run and the, and the bike so that I could stay ahead in the paddle. So I didn't want to stop and have a look what the problem was, so I thought, I'll just persevere. And the damn thing <laughs> was really annoying. It was starting to, actually, I figured out it was slowing me down, all that splashing and drag at the front. And damn it, halfway through the paddle, John caught me. He was, it was in the gorge, and I was really disappointed, of course. But I thought, at least I might be able to stay with him if I can get that damn thing off the front. <laughs> so I said to John, because I knew him, I said, John, could you have a wee look as you pass me? <laughs> could, you, could you have a look and see what it is that's dragging and splashing in the water? And he paddled up beside me and he says, Oh, Steve, it looks like this. someone's done a repair. And um, oh, no. So Dad must have had a wee accident and he's had to fix it. So I, you know, I hung on to John as long as I could be, took off, and he got about a 10 or 15 minute lead. And I never, well, I came second in the race. I never caught him up. Anyway, back at the finish line, after all the excitement had died down, I went and had a look to see what was wrong with my boat. And. <laughs> There was duct tape all around the front of the boat. So Dad had, he didn't realise I just wanted a wee bit of duct tape to hold the, the, the piece of cord back, and he'd gone round and round and round and round with half a roll of duct tape. He didn't know how good this duct tape was. And so then I realised, of course, it's my problem. You know, I didn't do the six Ps. Prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Did you get that? Prior planning prevents piss poor performance. So, so um, I hadn't spent the time to plan with my dad how I wanted things. I'd done some stuff, but I hadn't thought about everything. And it's then I made a promise that I'd do very detailed planning. So from then on, I 
you know, when I send my entry into the race, months before it, uh, before the race, I'll be typing up a list of everything that could possibly go wrong, you know, um, and the things I needed done. And those things could, would have obviously include uh, things like getting a puncture on the bike, the support crew vehicle running out of fuel or breaking down or getting a puncture, uh, putting a hole in my kayak or a, a shoe going missing in one of the transitions, a, a, high, a helmet got lost. Uh, if it was a hot day, I might need some extra cooling, um, some ice in my drink bottles, that sort of stuff. So I end up with, as I say, about four, four pages of this sort of stuff, all these things that could go wrong. And then I have three columns beside that column. And I think of cures, preventions, and possible innovations that could come out of that. So I've got a bit of a brand, you know, an image for being an innovative thing here. You know, that you may remember the pod and those sorts of things I invented. This is where, where I got those ideas. But what I'm interested in sharing with you is the plan. So what's better, a cure or a prevention? Prevention, yeah. That's the, the fence at the top of the cliff instead of the ambulance at the bottom, which is the cure. So, for example, putting a hole in my kayak, uh, the cure would be duct tape, right? But by then, I've, my boat's filled up with water. I've had to pull to the side, empty it out, wait for it all to dry, put the duct tape on and paddle on. And so that's probably half an hour if you're really quick. That's, so your race is over, really, you know, if you're trying to win it. So the prevention, of course, is... What's the prevention for that? Sorry? Yeah, well, no, checking your kayak and making sure it's warm. Checking your kayak, okay, so you don't want, want to leak in it, that's right. But preventing putting a hole in my kayak would be... Sorry? Avoiding the areas where it's most likely to get a hole. Okay, avoiding the areas where it's rocky, where you put a hole in. Yeah, what else? Don't hit the rock in the first place. How would I not hit the rock in the first place? Skills, yep, right, so skills is a good one, isn't it? So I need to make sure I do some really good, uh, get some really good instruction, so I'm really good at that. I'll go and do some white water courses, get really good in a plastic playboat, so I'm really skilled in the river. I personally um, was at that level, so I wanted to get an extra notch ahead, so I'd, I trained on rivers that were harder than the Waimak, and, um, got, and so the Waimak would be really easy. And other things you can do, what's another prevention? Can anyone think of another one? A good boat, yeah. So what's a good boat? For a beginner, you might say, right, I'm going to paddle a plastic sea kite because if I had a rock, it's not going to put a hole in it. If, um, if I'm an advanced paddler, I'll buy a, kayak, a Kevlar kayak that, you know, it's much more bulletproof or, or rockproof. So, so that's an example of um, what I did with my, the six Ps. Well, another example would be um, the support crew vehicle. You know, I'd make sure I get it serviced and I'd have good tyres and my support crew knew, knew where the, the, the spare tyre and the tools and the jack and all that stuff were. And a, 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 a reminder to them to fill up the, the, the car once they're driven over to the pre-race briefing. You know, go to Greymouth and Hunkers and fill it up before we come back again. Uh, or even a spare can of petrol in the, in the, in the back. <laughs> you, hear, you hear stories of competitors running around and running around the, the, um, the transition. Where's my crew? Where are you? And the, and the crew's either slept in because the alarm didn't go off or um, the car's broken down or run out of petrol, that sort of stuff. So it does happen quite often. And I've seen too when... Competitors have come to a transition and the support crew couldn't find the shoe that dropped back at the last time. So, the, I mean, in the true spirit of the race, there's, everyone rallies around and finds another shoe from someone else's bag somewhere that they don't need, a spare bag, and um, they can send the competitor on their way eventually, but not, after, not until they've lost an hour or two of, of, of hunting around. So that's another thing. I have a spares bag. So um, I have old, an old pair of shoes that I don't use anymore and a helmet and any spare equipment, clothing that we... Um, that the, the support crew might need. So then I also type up a plan. So I, I, I start about a week before the race, um, um, listing off things I need to do, like get the bike serviced and check the rudder cables on my kayak and all those sorts of things, uh, pack the bags, uh, get the car ready, um, book, the, book all the, well, you should have booked the hotel months out, those sorts of things. So the, the plan is all those sorts of things. And then I'll have also ETAs, you know, what time I'm expected to arrive at each transition so my crew isn't wondering and guessing and nervous that they might have missed me. I'll have a list of what should have been in each bag. Each transition bag has a list of what equipment should be in there so they can check it off. And I even draw diagrams on how I'd like my kayak laid out and where the paddle has to be and that sort of stuff. And then I invite the crew around for a, a barbecue lunch a week before the event and we practice on the back, back lawn exactly how we're going to do the transitions and we have a stopwatch and we try different ways of putting the spray suit on and who's going to hold what and who's going to hand me the paddle and my paddle's got labelled you know, red tape on the left and a green tape on the right so they know which way to give it to me. All these little things, attention to detail. So essentially my support crew, the aim here is my support crew doesn't feel the stress. So who's been support crew? 
And you know how stressful it is, don't you? Wondering where you got, we're in the right place, the right time, and you got the right stuff out. And um, who's been abused as support crew? I've abused my support crew once, and I, you know, it's not nice. You see, you see it. Athletes come in, and something's gone wrong, and so they're yelling at their crew, and that's not on. That's not being good sport, and it happens though in the heat of the moment. So as an athlete, you don't want to do that. You want to be really cheerful to your crew. They've given up their day, their weekend, their time to be your crew. And um, so you want to be, be um, in a good mood with them. And that reflects back. You know, they're, they're, if they're in a good mood, you feel good as well. So the bottom line here is, as the athlete, it's your race. You take responsibility. You do all the planning and leave your crew in no doubt as what their job is. And they can, rely, uh, they can just focus on, on being happy and, and being there for you. Six Ps. Prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Um, one of the things is with this race is Steve, Steve might get that sorted, um, is it can be really complicated. It can feel really, really complicated, this event, and all this, this race planning and, and all that sort of thing. And Steve's plan was trying to make it simple for his crew so there's less chance of things going wrong. But a lot of that stuff that you're doing is simple because that's what I've trained with and try not to change anything leading up into the race and just do what you, you, you're going to do. Um, this race is super exciting, and I think this is probably one of the best parts of the race. Um, who knows where this is? Aitken's Corner. Uh, there's a chair down the front here. Yep. Aitken's Corner. So what? Yep. Just down here. What happens at Aitken's Corner? Yep. So you've just done the first bike ride, and you've just swapped, and you're in your running shoes, and you've taken your helmet off. There's another chair down the front here, Steve and um, you're off on the mountain run. One of the things that makes this part of the race so exciting is you've got all these people up here and they're all looking back to see where their, 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 their person that they're supporting is. Um, Hayden here was one of the first ones through into the, um, into the two day, into the mountain run this year. So hey, there's lots of buzz and excitement and as the bunch goes in and they all come through and, and transitions and all those sorts of things are, are organized. So it's Really, really, it can be complicated. Let's try and keep it simple. And if we can keep it simple, then we can enjoy the ride. And you can give out lots of high fives and have lots of fun with it and enjoy um, this key part of the race. In terms of a way to help to keep it simple, I like to, I think goal setting is really important with that. So I like to think about three ways of setting some goals. I like to say there's an outcome goal, there's a performance goal, and a process goal. The outcome goal is the thing at the top. What I want to achieve. For Steve, it was he wanted to win. For you, it might be I want to finish the thing. It might be I want to finish in the top half of the field. Whatever that might be. But hey, I think it's important to set that because if you set that, that's the reason why you get out of bed in the morning. That's the reason why when it's dark and cold, you get up and you just do your run and get it done. But you can't control that because there's so many other factors that affect whether you're going to achieve that or not. <clears throat> Underneath the outcome goal is a performance goal. So your performance goal is looking at breaking the course down into its sections and say, okay, well, I want to be at Goat Pass Hut by this time, and then I'm going to be at Klondike Corner by this time. And if you achieve those little bits of time, then that should add up to the outcome goal and achieving that performance. Underneath that, like that, that performance goal, you still can't really control that super well because, hey, there's this weather affects this race, and there's lots of other things that goes on as well. So... What I like to think about underneath that is a process goal. What are some process goals that we can do? So process goals are, are the things that happen in the now. So things like, okay, we're gonna, uh, have I eaten recently? What's my technique right like? Am I standing up nice and tall? Um, I had a, someone that I worked with a couple of years ago and one of her process goals was I want to smile at every camera. Okay, so if she's smiling at every camera, even though she's not wanting to smile sometimes, she's smiling at every camera, her brain thinks she's happy and she makes you feel better. Um, giving people high fives is good because you give them a high five, they cheer you on and hey, you're happy as a result of that. If you give out a bit of, a bit of um, thanks to marshals and things that again, they're not paid, they're just out there um, cheering you on, they'll probably cheer you back even more so it lifts you as well. So thinking about that process goal underneath, what can I actually do will affect that next level with the performance goal and hey if you do those things well well then you'll probably achieve the outcome goal at the top end. Okay so keep it simple, break it down into its bits and um, just enjoy the ride because it's super cool, super fun and it's actually really achievable. Okay last story. So 
I am not a naturally talented athlete. Um, I had to get my wins by some other way. So I just want to tell you how it started. I met Robin Judkins. So who's met Juddy? Oh, mate, I can't give out a cheer to all those people. But anyway, Juddy's this eccentric, sort of enthusiastic, highly intelligent nutter. And uh, I just met him at the movie theatre. I just um, I was at a university at the time, and he explained to me how he's going to race, organise this race. Starts on the west coast, finishes on the east coast. It's got that completeness, and it goes over the, the main divide, the Southern Alps. You need these mountaineering skills, or mountain running skills, and kayaking. Anyway, I was immediately sold because I'd done a bit of kayaking and biking and running. And I thought, yeah, I can do this. In fact, I reckon I can win it. So I trained really hard that summer, and I. Uh, I had a goal, I was going to win this race. I was pretty convinced I could win it. First place was my goal, but I failed. I came 22nd, which is to me quite a failure. But that's right, I wasn't put off because it was such an exciting race. I thought, right, I'm going to double my training and next year I'll win the race. Set the goal to win, I failed again. I came third. The third's a whole lot closer than 22nd, I'm on track. So then I um, doubled my training again. I thought, right, I, I, can, I can win it this year. I entered the next year, aimed to win, failed again. Came second. The second's a whole lot closer than the third. I need one more to go. So I doubled my training again. Into the race, going to win it. Came second again. I failed again. And so I got a wee bit dejected there. I thought, well, actually, you know, it was working, doubling my training, but it, then it stopped working. I wasn't quite sure what to do after that. So I started getting into the field of mental excellence, you know, NLP. You know, it's, it's understanding what do people do in their heads that get some success and how can I model that for my own racing. And I learned, of course, that I need to train smarter, not harder. And um, I also learned that I got into overtraining syndrome. I was doing 55 hours a week training that, that last year, and that was definitely not allowing time for recovery. So Rich is going to explain more about that. He's the expert on that stuff as, as a professional coach. But um, I, I, the, the, I said I got into um, NLP, the study of what a successful people do. And one of the traits of successful people is that they don't see failure as failure. They just see failure as Learning, yep, uh, bit, pocket pack of chips here, learning. Lady, in, lady with the blonde hair glasses, yep. Um, they see failure as feedback. All results are useful. And so I want to highlight that to you guys. You know, every time I see an international come over and they expect, you know, there's some champion in their country and they're expecting they're going to win this race, no one really ever does. It's, the first race is always a learning experience and failure is just learning. And so... Um, your first race is likely to be that too. And if, even if you're graduating up from the two day to the one day, you're still going to be learning. And so failure is not failure. And at, at races like this, it's in the wilderness. It's not, if you want something that's really repeatable, you go and do the, you know, around the track thing in the stadium or even a marathon on the road. But this is a mountain race. And that is why we enter the race, because there's a chance you could hurt yourself and you're going to manage yourself, you're going to manage your safety, you're going to assess risk and you're going to end up at the finish line safe and happy because you've done it you've, your way. So, you know, there's things like falling over and you're going to bang your elbow and you, it might hit your nose. There's, every year we see someone come off the run with some blood pouring out of their, their body somewhere. But they, they soldier on because this is a mountain race. This is coast to coast. And, um, you know, this falling out of your kite, just get back in again. Um, crashing off the bikes, it happens every year. Someone crashes, bunch riding, that sort of stuff. Most people, if they can, they'll get back on the, the bike. And, and I've even had people finish with broken collarbones and things. You know, they just get back on and do it. And <laughs> so I just want to impress upon you that do expect failure. Do expect things to go not as you planned. But that's the mark of a, an adventure athlete. A, a Kathmandu Coast to Coast athlete figures a way around that. You know, we have to be agile and, and get back on. And therein lies the satisfaction. You get to the finish line, you look back and you say, wow, that was tough. And that's why not everybody does it. That's why you all have chosen to do it, because it's tough. Look at that, that's <laughs> graceful. Cool, go on. Oh, my pants. I took my pants off, is that okay? Okay. Right, I want to quickly just whiz through this one, because I think it underpins uh, everything in terms of endurance training. Um, basically, what we want to think about, the training that we do is a, is a stress on your body. Okay, so more, more, more is better to a point. And it comes to a point that, hey, you actually, like Steve said, there's 55 hours of training a week. It actually gets worse. So if you look at this graph, hey, if you went for a 30-minute hard run, that's going to affect your body. You're going to be a bit sore and tired afterwards. But as long as you have enough time off to recover, you're going to be better than what you were before. 
I do another 30 minute hard run, I'm going to be better than what I was before. And it might get to the point that you know, I have to do a 60 minute hard run to affect you to the same amount I'm better than what I was before. What we don't want to happen is I do this session and then I go and do another one here. Well that's okay actually because you're still here. You go to another session and then you get down here. Another session you don't recover enough. And this line down here could be the line of being sick, injured, overtrained. I just don't want to do it anymore. I'm not a very good wife, husband, uh, worker, etc. So we don't want to get down here. So that's really, really important. The things that affect this, how, how much this affects you, like how much this line comes down, is the type of exercise. So running it is harder than biking and harder than kayaking. Things like how hard you go will affect it. That's probably number one, how hard it is. And then how long you go for as well will affect how much training stress you put on your body. If you're a, um, somebody that hey, has got a relatively sedentary job, but you don't have much time, a 30 minute hard run, you can get a lot out of that because you've got actually lots of time to recover and where you go, so that's good. But if you've got a physical job and you're like build fences or whatever, or a farmer, hey, that's, you might not be able to cope with that. So that's something that we need to think about. The factors that affect how much you recover, like number one is actually sleep. If you're sleeping well, you're gonna go well. If you're a shift worker, you're gonna battle a little bit more than if you um, have, your, have your regular sort of routine. So sleep's number one, nutrition's really important there as well. And the other thing is stress. I've had people that are continuing doing the training, it's all good, but work has just gone crazy. And then all of a sudden they're just in this deep dark hole. Nothing's changed in terms of here, but, but, the, but hey, they're not recovering enough, they keep doing the training and then just dig themselves the hole. So it's really important just to listen to your body and then keep communicating with those people around you so then you can be looked after and, and ultimately keep improving. Right. Hit the button. Okay, also wanted to uh, talk a little bit about support crew as well. Um, actually, before that, Team CP, that's, that's the coaching business that we've had for almost 10 years, actually. The CP stands for Complete Performance, and why it's called Complete Performance is back in the early days, when I was doing lots of racing and, and longer stay and all that sort of stuff, it's actually really hard to say that I absolutely nailed it. Really, really hard, because there's all these rocks around, and these rapids to float down, and there's bunches to hang out in, and hey, I need to get my nutrition right, and I need to pace myself, and on and on and on the list goes. So I guess that's the ultimate thing. Um, as, is, as, as we've evolved, what we're really more about now is really the team of people. So one thing we try and do is give people a, a top so we can jump out of the bushes and cheer them on, which works really, really well for the next 20 meters. And then they go around the corner and go, oh my God, what have I done? So something to be aware of. In terms of support crew, Steve's talked a little bit about what he's done in his transitions and trying to, he'll talk about keep moving forward the whole time and don't stop while you're, while you're going through your transition. And that's really good, that's awesome, and that's probably the quickest way to do it as long as it's well practiced. The other thing you need to think about is, what's my goal? What am I trying to do here? What am I, what am I up to? Um, and the transitions are actually one of the best parts of the race, because there's lots of people there, there's lots of buzz and excitement. So, hey, take a deck chair, sit down, get properly fed, have something to eat, make sure you're comfortable, ready to set up with all your gear on, and then away you go. That's totally fine as well. You don't want to faff around, but actually that's fine too. So actually having a wee plan of how I'm going to do that is super important. The other question we get is how many support crew should I have? I'd say two is a good number if you're doing the two day. You can do it with one. One means that that person, um, hey, they have to hang out by themselves and drive by themselves. It's two, it's a bit more fun for them. One thing that we've developed also in the last year or two is actually Matt here. He's one of our support crew team, so we've developed a bit of a product service that we can actually help people to do the race and we can be your support crew, which has worked really well just because it's so tricky to actually get people on a Friday, off work on a Thursday as well. So there's those options out there too. Should we talk about some gear? Yep, I reckon, shall we? Welcome, Chris. Chris, come on in, Chris. Round hey. applause, please. Hey. Right, I'll uh, try and operate this while holding here. Okay. But, um, we'll start with some footwear first. Um, basically, for people who are trying to get into the train and using the rivers and stuff like that, if you're used to running on the road and around the city or on the local trails, there's some key things that a shoe like this or a trail shoe will make a big difference to your ability um, and also your comfort. Something like this is a Sense Marin from Solomon. Um, there's also a Saucony version of it. One of the key points, 
is your low height. Now this gives you your stability. So traditional road shoes will have a lot more height in the stack of it, which means every time you put your foot down, if you're on uneven terrain, you'll roll around a little bit more. So a low profile shoe will give you a bit more comfort because it will give you that stability and traction. Um, Sole is also very, very important because you want a nice big comfort, uh, sorry, contact area on the river stones, um, especially when you're going through those boulders. So that kind of stuff is, is really important. Uh, another thing as well, with a shoe that's low profile, a lot of the trail shoes you come out are really flexible, and this helps give you a lot more of a feeling of what, what you're running on. Um, so other shoes around will also have that ability, but the and trail shoe will give you the flexibility. So when you land on uneven terrain, you can feel that and take response from it. So that means you don't only get thrown off, the shoe will help you. So those sorts of things are really important. Other aspect is your mesh. So mesh upper means the water's going to drain because you're going to go through a lot of water during that race. So you're looking for things like that. Um, this also has a gusset in the tongue, which is actually really cool. So the tongue is attached to the sole, which means gravel's not going to fall down in the gap in your laces into your shoe. So little things like that make a really big difference to your run on the day. Having laces that you can tuck away up underneath there. So it's really simple and easy to use, which also means it won't snag on anything and they're gone and they won't come undone. So little tips like that are really, really cool on a shoe like that. Now, packs. Um, these are currently packs in our running range. We've got uh, Nitron and Mirage. The cool thing, uh, sorry, Axial on the far side. The, the cool thing about packs like these packs is they'll fit all your compulsory gear. So, they will pack out with your polypros, your dermals, your emergency bag packs, your survival kits, all of which you can get from us as well. And we do have a competitor's gear list, so we've gone through and selected the gear. Purchase your gear based on what you're going to want to use for training and outside as well. So that's really cool, but the packs are all designed to carry that. Um, I'll tell you, actually, I raised my hand while my, while my, support, my athlete growled at me on my second time supporting at I've been in seven times a support group. And, um, Mine was actually because when I zipped up the pack, I put the zips at the top. Which was really good for her, because she felt really good on the second half of the run as her pack got lighter and lighter. Unfortunately, the zips had gone down and separated, which her gear was slowly getting dropped down on the course. So she got there feeling great, the pack was real light, so it had nothing in it. So she wasn't really pleased with me. One cool thing about these, zips can go to the side on this one, You've also got an attachment, so you can stitch gear in here as well, and it holds in. So that's kind of cool. Now, too, yeah, the phone's really handy. Front pockets, as well. One kind of cool thing is you can stash all your gear, your fluid as well. Um, this is actually going to be available very shortly. It's a soft flask, so you can take that off and scoop up water as you run. Put the flask back on, run from it, drink from it, stash it back in. These will be available by the time Coast Coast comes around season so that's something new coming from us the other hydration option is a cup um, pretty simple again will be available in time for the race that's the cool thing about it so you can clip on has a hoop I actually recently used one of these myself at a swim run where you run in a wetsuit for 50ks and the course was cup free so you had to carry one if you wanted to drink because they didn't provide it checkpoints. So, really cool because you can stuff this anywhere. Up the inside of your shorts, it's gone, you don't have to carry around, bang it around, you can do whatever you need with it attached to your pack. So, really cool, they'll be out as well. And then finally, jacket. Um, one of the really cool things, Rich is going to now put on a jacket which is stored on the side of this pack. Right here is our Zeolite, which is our ultra lightweight, packable, waterproof, seam sealed raincoat. So it's designed for running. Cool thing is one of the nice features, when you open it up, if you zip, decide to zip it a little bit for venting, it actually has a clip. So that it doesn't flap and hit you in the face the whole time while you're running. So that's really cool because it can hold that on for you. The other feature which Rich is going to show you right now, as well he's been running and going up the gorgeous side of the rain and he's put his raincoat on, he can do that. It actually fits over top of his pack, and once he's zipped it up, it 
It's actually clear and you can see your race number throw underneath it. So you can throw it over top of all of your gear. So, if you're using it in a running race, obviously coast to coast you want your bib over top, but if you're using it elsewhere, running races, you can get the number and you can see it underneath. So, but the really cool thing is throw it over to your pack, then you suddenly it gets too hot, so going down the other side, doesn't need it anymore, strips it back off, stuffs it in the side pocket. So, really cool little ways to get rid of it all um, and store it, but as you saw when you pulled it out, it's tiny, it's one of the smallest running waterproof coats you find around, so, and it's fully waterproof, breathable, pretty special. Um, now, you can't really visit head office without giving you a little bit of a teaser, so... I have managed to pull out the other one there. That's right. Something special coming your way soon. This doesn't yet have an ETA because it's still in development. It looks like a pretty good sample, but it's still being worked on. Now this is a vest pack. So it's taking the new running harnesses of the past and making a few alterations to it. So the bonus of this is that because it is designed as a full vest. It sticks on and is nice and firm, doesn't move at all when you run around. You've got eight pockets on the front, all velcro closures, so you've got endless amounts of storage space in the front as well. Space up in here for dumping your gel rubbish as well, so that's a small one you can stuff down in there. Um, you've got endless amounts of attachments if you want running poles, you can attach them on there. As you run, you can pull tight, and that will actually get rid of and compress your pack as you drink and your bladder goes down. So, something really, really cool, but um, as I say that, that's about as much as you can see. So, it will go back in the pack. Well done. Well, awesome. give Chris a hand, thank you. And thank you, Chris, for hosting us tonight. Thanks for doing the job. Just want to point out that the bibs have gone through an evolution process. Those who've done the race over the last couple of years will realise that we've had some pretty disastrous bibs, but they've come up with a really good iteration now that stretches over the top of anything. PFD's the lot. Cool. Right, so we, we're racing through now. We're hoping we've designed our little stories that's, that have given you enough answers to many of these questions, but uh, we're going to go through the ones that haven't been covered yet. For example, um, the mountain run, We've covered the, the equipment, like the shoes and all that sort of stuff. Thank you, Chris. Someone had a question about the socks. So, um, cotton's out, and socks that whip away and feel still you know, nice and comfortable when they're wet. So I, I love Merino. You can get a lot of other uh, synthetic versions of that sort of thing as well. I'm sure Catman do sell both. I've got a Merino trail running sock, yep. um, which is also on the computer as well. So. Right, okay. The height of the sock? What's the story with the height of the sock? Not to wear the ankle. Oh, yes, the ankle ones that let the gravel down the side of them, no. So you want a good height sock, um, just to stop it for nothing else other than stopping the gravel. Coming up to it, so. Yeah, that's right. Actually, as uh, another wee tip, you can get little gaiters that you can put on on the top to stop the gravel going down. So it seems to depend a bit on people's running style, whether they get gravel in or not. I do, and I actually you made little lycra li ones that are hot mouth glue gunned onto the top. They just stretch on as I pull the shoe on, so there's lots of options. We're chopping the top off a sock, so you've just got the top piece and, and stitching that onto your shoe, that sort of stuff. Or just the commercial ones, they're quite light as well. Okay, um, what else is there? Yeah, talking gear, talking kayaks. Kayak gear, okay, so kayaks, um, I really thoroughly recommend resisting the urge to buy a skinny fast one and go with a conservative stability boat. So make sure that your boat is a stable boat and um, you know, anything can happen on race day. You can, you can be a bit more tired than you thought you would be. You can um, have hurt yourself, and you're, you're going to be looking forward to a nice stable boat. But most importantly, you want most of your energy to going into straight down the river, not being nervous. And I see it time and time again. Nervous athletes coming up to a rapid, and, and it's wasting so much energy being nervous and wobbling, and some of them even fall out before they even get to the rapid because of that. So you're on the side of, of a stable boat. Um, and as I suggested before, plastic's a good idea for your first year. How expensive is it, Steve? So how expensive? Kayaks. Well, get on Trade Me and Sports Hub for looking for second-hand boats. Now's a good time. They're cheaper now than they are as, as summer rolls around. Oh, the sky's the limit, really. $2,000, $3,000 for a new one, and um, second-hand is not much cheaper, actually, if you're buying things like eclipses and those sorts of things. 
think one key thing with a kayak is it's got really good resale value. So what you buy it for, you probably sell it for about the same amount, especially if it's a second hand one. So hey, you've got some money tied up in it, but you should be able to get the same amount back for it. Can I suggest with your sea kayak, don't do what I did and buy a sea kayak that's really old and really heavy. This is my, it was just too slow. So too Millie's too suggesting too don't buy a big heavy one. <laughs> that, and, well, that, Really stable, wasn't going to tip out. And are very bulletproof too, very bulletproof. but hard to handle in training, especially if you're a woman trying to lift them up on top of the car. Yeah. So what I can recommend is uh, a race sponsor actually, uh, Barracuda Kayaks, are making the beach coma, and they've just made a new one, which names escapes me every time. It's a bit narrower and faster and longer than the beach coma. So they've got the beginner level and the intermediate level as well. So those boats are a lightweight plastic, they're vacuum molded and really worth doing, uh, buying and excellent resale value. So, it's good that they're on board as a sponsor. They also, the other ones that make the duo for the tandems, tandem teams, so those of you doing the tandem team, the, the double one, the double version of the beach cover is what you'll be paddling. And there are a few of those available um, at Flock Hill Station, I believe, for hire if you want to go and practice and train down the river. Um, once again, though, you need your grade two certificate or at least be capable, competent on the river before you go heading down there. So, um, yeah, check out Flock Hill, or the website, Coast to Coast website will have more information on that. And the other thing is a wing paddle as well. I didn't pick up a wing paddle until November and save a lot of energy with those as well. So Billy's just mentioned a wing paddle. The reason why a wing paddle is quite a lot better than just a flat blade is the way it goes through the water. So you can use more of your body, you can use your legs and your hips and your core a lot more, opposed to just really your arms. And yeah, it goes out and catches fresh water as you come come through it as well into a J. So yeah, if, again, it's a budget thing, but if you can get one of those, that would make your job a little bit easier as well. Um, should we talk about? So foot, footwear was one question. What do I do in terms of um, going for the run and the bike? On the first leg, you've got a little run off the beach, and then you transition onto the bike. I've done all sorts of different things. I think at the end of the day, keep it really simple, especially if it's your first time. Run in running shoes and then kick them off with some bungee laces, roll your bike out, jump on your bike, and, um, and ride in cycle shoes. Those running shoes off the first leg will be taken, collected up by the race organisation and taken to Klondike Corner or the finish line, you can pick them up then. So put your name on them in your race number with a felt tip marker. Use some old ones, it's good. Yep. Yeah, and then for the, um, for the second day or the carrying on, so you've got a short bike ride and get down into your boat, there's a few different ways of what to wear there, but hey, probably number one I'd recommend if you're able to is mountain bike shoes, because you can bike in those and then run down the hill. Um, what, another option, you could bike in your cycle shoes and have your um, kayak booties in your back pocket, whip those out, and then you're going to change yourself before you head down the river. The kayak booties, I wouldn't recommend those high ones with zips, because they take a bit longer to put on. Even though it's okay, but you can probably pick up a real cheap, cheapy pair of warehouse ones that slip on real quick. And um, the other thing with that is running down the gravel road, it's quite a bit of gravel that will intrude and might bruise your foot. Um, so you can put an extra pair of insoles in these booties. So buy them slightly big enough, big, a bit bigger, so you can put some extra insoles in to protect your shoes, uh, your, your soles. Especially when it's cold in the morning, your feet are really sensitive and, and that's not a very nice thing to run down and you're your, um, sore on your feet. Let's answer that one, that's pretty straightforward. Aid stations. There aren't any aid stations. <laughs> so um, it's not like a triathlon. Good question though. And um, it's all up to you and your support crew about where you have food and, and water and that sort of stuff. The aid stations are the transitions effectively. Between those, you have to manage yourself. So the other question on the cycle there was drafting. So I think that was covered, just to clarify, because I screwed it up. <laughs> um, Two-day race, you're allowed to draft anywhere. One-day race, you're allowed to draft only on the first bike leg out of Kam or through Kamara up to the start of the run. And, it's, and, and, and then the, the, the one-day race, did I say that right? Yes. Yeah. One day race, it's um, time trialling from there on. So the middle bike leg and the last bike leg. So on that note though, I, I, you know, that, as I said, that last bike leg into Christchurch, for if you're a two day competitor, it can be quite demoralising if you're knackered. So you want to look around as you're finishing the kayaking, plan who you're going to ask to bike with or you know, spot someone and, and see if you can get out of the transition at the same time as then so you can share the drafting on the way home. And even if you are not equal ability, it's good um, like let's say someone is stronger than you and you're only going to be able to take a couple of turns at the front, that's okay, it's going to help them anyway, and you're all going to get there together much quicker. Yeah. The coast-to-coast -coast longest day and the two-day are quite two different events. If you want 
to experience the coast to the coast and everything that's good about the coast to coast, the two day is really the key event because you can actually race it. There's more people around and it's just more fun and exciting. Versus the longest day. When I did the longest day last time, I didn't see anybody from the end of the mountain run to this edge of Christchurch. So it was just one great big old time trial. It's just me versus the course. Whereas on the two day, you restart again and everybody's together and you, you're bunch riding and all that sort of stuff. So, so just think about that. The longest day is an awesome challenge, but the coast to coast is about the two-day, that's where it started as well. So it's not, it doesn't have to be just about the longest day. Day two start order. So um, day two start order is determined by your, uh, you're seated basically, uh, determined by your previous day's time. So by the end of the Friday, they'll have posted up um, at Clonnet Corner the start order for the next morning. On that note, it's quite an early start. Your support crew needs to, well, yeah, if they're going to go, they need to be out of, on that corner campground by, I think it's 5.30, so you're going to be standing around a lot in the cold. One way to do that is to get have um, someone, a mate up there with a camper van you can go and stay in. Uh, but your crew needs to be out and down to get your kayak scrutiny in really early. So what the organisation does is we provide you a, a, a warm-up bag. You put any warm-up clothing into that bag and dump it at the start line of day two and take that to the finish for you. So uh, just to let you know, that's how, how, the, how the start order goes on day two. Uh, talking quickly about cramp, I'm an expert with cramp because I try and race like I used to uh, but don't do any training so therefore uh, I am an expert in cramp. Um, so basically the key reason why cramp occurs, it's not so much about nutritional salts and that sort of stuff, it's really about have I trained to the intensity that I'm going to race at and the duration that I'm going to race at. You don't see any marathon runners at the Olympics getting cramp because that's the level that they're training and racing at. You see a lot of people like me in the coast to coast too though when I've just turned up to have a crack at it and it's all sorts of trouble. Um, so it's a matter of pacing yourself really well and training to that level that you're going to race at, I think is really important. And then, hey, how do I deal with cramp when I've got it? You've got to kind of switch your brain off and go to your happy place, I think that's important. But the worst thing I think you can do is stop and try and stretch it out. Because as soon as you start to try and move again, bam, you've got it again. And then you're in all sorts of trouble because you sort of stopped. What I'll try and do is I try and emphasize other muscles as I'm moving, so you can sort of try and relax that bit as it's happening, try and keep moving forward, because if you stopped, you're not going anywhere, and just try and emphasize, hey, maybe it's my glutes, and take the weight on my hamstrings, or, and, and here you go. Okay, so, um, what if you withdraw? That's a bit of a curly question, isn't it? And it's a bit like the blue tree, you know, if I say to you, don't, don't think about a blue tree, and don't think about the color blue, and blue flashing lights on the blue tree with blue branches, what color are you thinking about? Blue, yeah, I don't. But I told you not to think about blue, didn't I? And so, I, I, if you're thinking about withdrawing, I think that's kind of a less than useful approach. Think about how you can achieve the race and how you can win it, or how you can, you know, not win it, but necessarily how you can achieve your goals. So, I'm not quite sure what that question is. What if you withdraw? Um, but I will answer it to say that um, you must report in. Of course, if you're on the mountain run and you decide to withdraw, you're going to have to get some helicopter out or something. So you're going to. You have to wait for the tail and Charlie and walk out with them, or if it's an emergency, they'll helicopter you out. But if you decided to transition, you're going to pull out, well, you just need to go out, you must report to the timekeepers and let them know that you've done that, and you hand in your transponder so they're not going to send off some search party. Is that right? Has anyone got any further questions on that one? Cool, right. I'll have a crack at this mum and dad, kids, is it doable, plus work and everything else that you're doing as well? Um, I think it's totally doable. It's. Um, it just comes down to what your expectations are, and the key way that you're going to make it doable is just trying to be really consistent with what you do in your training. So you're just doing little bits often, and then you can keep moving forward, and then it's about simulating what you're going to do on race day. Just block a couple of dates on the family calendar, and okay, go, right, that day, and that day, and that day, I'm going to do some big missions out in the hills. You need to do at least three or four on the calendar, because probably two of them might be rained off. And, uh, and you don't want to be scrambling to try and grab another date on the calendar later on. So it's about being really consistent and then also being realistic about what the expectations are um, and pacing yourself really well and having a good plan. If you do that, I think it is really doable. Would you agree with that, Billy? Yes. I work full-time as a teacher as well as treatment and everything else. And I did it. So Millie's working first time, uh, full-time and she's also doing her treatment and she still managed to do the race. That's just for the camera to get the soundtrack. Nice work, here. Yeah. So, um, there's kayaking. Oh, on that note, actually, um, I did one year I did the race as a team with Robin Jokins. You know how Robin Jokins is? He's really unfit. 
and he managed to make the cutoff times too. So if he can, Millie can, then you can. Right, so just about the, the kayaking events. Uh, Warm-up kayaking events. Well, I know right now there's the Brass Monkey series on, is that right? Excellent, brilliant. Go and do those. Um, and you can do it in just a standard, I mean, do it in some sta stable boat if you're a bit nervous about it, being cold and all that. Well, take a, a conservative choice of boat. Oh, do you? Oh, I don't know. Grade two? No, you no, don't have to have grade two. Um, then they're really um, thorough on that. Those guys are good. Yeah. Was this Sunday? This Sunday coming up? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Race two for the brass monkey. I think it's five. Is that right? Usually four. four. Okay. So other warm up events uh, over as you get closer to summer. Do you know if any yet? Yeah. yeah. So there's um and this is for true people traveling from out of town as well. There's a there's a race series that goes from Woodstock to the end of the into the kayak stage now, which is really cool, so people have really enjoyed that. There's also the Wynak Classic, which uh, the date's not fully confirmed, whether it's December or January, how they'll do that one this year, so that's another really good kayak option. And I think it's just a matter of talking to lots of people. Come and, um, with my contact details, just send me, send me some questions and I can help you out with kayak races in your local area as well. Yeah, there used to be a race down the Ringers Harder River, the lower section. I, um, I don't know if it still runs. The Salmon Run, that's another one. Uh, that, right, that's got some good kayaking leg in it. So just your local triathlons put on by the Lions Club, those sorts of things are really good as well. Uh, kayak training in darkness hours. Um, so someone said they're, uh, they work hard and they don't get time to train in the light. Um, well, I know Arrowa Club, I don't live in Christchurch anymore, I've moved to Queenstown, but um, I know Arrowa Kayak Club do flat water sessions, I think it's a th Tuesday or Thursday night. And they're in the dark, and it's on the Avon River, so go and join those guys. Um, there's, yeah, paddling, I've always found paddling next to street lights works. Like I used to live in Monks Bay, I could paddle from there around, all, all the way around the, the road edge along the Estuary Causeway at high tide, all the way up to Ferrymead and back again. You can get a bit of training there when it's totally dark, morning or night. Um, so those, those are good options. Um, good idea to wear a little flashing light on your helmet or some sort of light that can be seen 360 degrees if you're on the Avon River, the rowers, you want to be able to see each other. Um, but yeah, it is hard. You just have to kind of rely on evening sessions like that and then the weekends get out and do your rough stuff um, or you know more challenging stuff. And I'd really encourage you safely <laughs> to go and train in rough weather. Like if it's a stormy day, then it's perfect to go and train on the Avon or the estuary, um, in the estuary where it's rough, big rough, rough waves, and you can, you can be learning or practicing your support strokes and getting used to rough weather. But I don't want to read about you um, next week, you know, died because Gurney told him to go and train in rough, rough weather. So what's some safety things? What's the first thing you need to think about? Ask the what if question. So if you're going to fall out, what, you, will you be safe? Will you be able to, like, is it an onshore wind? So don't train on an offshore wind if you're going to be in the beach. The beach is a great place to train, especially in small surf, you know, just, you know, half a metre high or less. Get used to um, the waves smashing on the side, that sort of stuff, and your support strokes. But be really wary of asking, or ask the what if question. If a, if a, if a front came through, what do I need to, you need to check the weather forecast. Um, if you're going to go to the beach in summer, it's a good idea to paddle uh, where the Surf Lifesaving Club is and someone's going to be watching out when, you, when, the, when the flags are out, that sort of stuff. On the um, estuary bar, it's a great place to train, but really bad when the tide's going out, those sorts of things. And um, if you're in the, it's the, I like the estuary itself because it's like a pond, isn't it? It's, always, it's, it's usually pretty shallow and it's not far to the edge, you know, you're going to get blown ashore somewhere. The Avon River is the same. So does that answer your question on that? Yep, cool. We've got two more to, I think, and then we've got most of our list. The mountain running one, there's, um, there's only one company that does that, that takes uh, mountain running guides, I think they're called, so, um, and they'll take you through and look after you and, um, and show you how to get over the mountain run as best as you can. Um, I think it's a really valuable thing if you can do that. It means you can then simulate your training and, um, and uh, simulate it in closer to home and things as well, if you know what you're up against. Yeah. You don't have to go over the mountain to the right. Oh, no, no, you don't. So friends and family, hopefully we might be able to, you guys to catch up with a few others that are in the room to be able to go and team up with someone else that's done it before. That's how I first started. And, yep, hiking over is a two-day thing as well. Quickly, just want to touch on nutrition. Um, Steve's talked about this. Uh, maybe don't follow all his um, <laughs> examples, but one of the key things with nutrition is variety. So you know 
um, you've, you've practiced it in variety, you've got different options of food. And the other key thing, things have changed a little bit in terms of nutrition, but the science now is not saying you need to have this much carbohydrate based on your body weight, it's more about how much you can cope with and how much you can absorb. So the guidelines now are saying between 60 and 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour as a general rule. Those, those gels are generally about 25 grams of carbohydrate, so that's 50 if you have a couple of those, and maybe some sports drink as well, and then, hey, that's uh, getting close. Can you do more? That's depending on what you can actually cope with and, and how you feel as you do that as well. And then, and then just trying lots of different options. Steve talked about savoury options. Baby food is a really good option. Having a little twisty top, squeezy with apple and custard, you'll feel pretty smug about yourself as you do that. <laughs> yeah. Could you give the person next to you a high five? You've nailed it, you've made it to the end. Good stuff. And we look forward to seeing you on the finish line in New Brighton between 2 and midnight on 